chapter 17, verses 5 through 10. It's on page 80 in the New Testament section of the Pew Bibles. The apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. The Lord replied, if you had faith the size of a mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. Who among you would say to your slave who has just come in from plowing or tending sheep in the field, come here at once and take your place at the table? Would you not rather say to him, prepare supper for me, put on your apron and serve me while I eat and drink? Later you may eat, later you may eat and drink. Do you thank the slave for doing what was commanded? So you also, when you have done all that you were ordered to do, say, we are worthless slaves. We have done only what we ought to have done. May God bless our understanding to these readings of Holy Scripture. In a previous church where I served, a a friend had asked me how I got there to that congregation because I made kind of a low-key entrance. There was no big installation service or anything. And I thought about that. And I thought also about the kind of interactions that Jesus had with those who were closest to us. This one being one of them that is uh, described in the Gospel of Luke when the apostles ask him to increase their faith, and he gives the example of the mulberry bush and, and how their trust in God could literally be used to, to change the world around them. And so as I, I, I tried to answer my friend uh, Ray's question about that, I thought back and, and I said, why don't you wait? I've got a little research I, I want to do. And so I'd like to share it with with you today because it really has to do with some circumstances that are unique to this kind of congregation, not just to you here in Encino, but to congregations of this size and, and dynamic. It all started back in 1855. No, I actually am not that old. It's just some days I feel like it. It started in 1855 with this gentleman by the name of Edward Kimball. He was a member at the Mount Vernon Congregational Church in the Beacon Hill District of Boston. And, and Ed Kimball was truly a saint among saints. We know this because he taught the junior high boys Sunday school class. And folks, it doesn't get any more devoted to the Lord than that. But he always felt like a failure as a Christian. Because in that day and and age, there was only one standard for whether you had been effective and impactful in, in the life of Christian faith, and that was had you personally led somebody else to the Lord, to faith in Christ. It was the, now we'd like to think we, we understand a variety of spiritual gifts a bit more, but in that time, in the mid-1800s, that was the one standard, and Ed Kimball never had. But he had a young boy who was growing up into a, a, a young man in, in his class, and he was constantly concerned about him. This kid was someone that today we might consider an at-risk youth. And Edward Kimball was concerned about his future and and literally the state of his soul. So one day, he summoned up all his courage because it was very unusual for him to do this kind of thing. He went to the shoe store where this this, uh, young young man worked at the time. There's nobody else in the store, went in there, and he asked him if he would like to uh, make a commitment to Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. And that was a big leap for Edward Kimball, but he did it. And amazingly, the young man said, yes, he would. So in, in the shoe store there, they nailed down, uh, kneeled down and prayed together, and this young man received Jesus Christ. To our knowledge, it was about the only major spiritual impact that Edward Kimball ever had. But what an impact it was. That young man was this guy, Dwight L. Moody. Actually, he was younger at the time. He didn't look like that when he was 15. 
But Dwight Moody was somebody whose ministry would impact people all over the world. Very shortly thereafter, he left the Boston area, moved to Chicago, started a little ministry among young people like himself, street kids, if you will. Um, he uh, later founded a, a vibrant church, which is uh, still quite active today. He started the Greater uh, Chicago Area YMCA. He was very uh, active in the uh, rebuilding efforts after the Chicago fire. He began to be doing some preaching, and somehow, in some way, uh, something about his, his life circumstances reached a pastor in England, a man by the name of Frederick B. Meyer. Fred Meyer was the pastor of the Priory Street Baptist Church in York, England, and for some reason that, that I was not able ever to find in, in my research, he had heard the name of Dwight Moody, and he invited him over to England to preach at some evangelistic services at the church. Uh, the Priory Street Church was not a large congregation. It was about the size of this congregation that we have assembled right here today. And they had an evangelistic event uh, scheduled. It was going to be a few nights during the week, and then the big push was going to be Friday, Saturday, Sunday nights. And so they welcomed the uh, new um, uh, visiting preacher from uh, the United States, Dwight Moody, and he preached a couple of services during the weeknights, and according to the reports, he was terrible. He was awful. As a matter of fact, there's a, uh, there's a line in a book that I read, a little a passage, a paragraph, where <laughs> Pastor Meyer is standing on the steps of the sanctuary wondering, what do we do? Should, should, we just, should we just send this young man back to the colonies and be done with him, and I'll preach the rest of the services? And the members talked him out of it. They said, no, let's stick with him. We brought him over here, we spent the money, and maybe God will use him to reach some people we couldn't otherwise reach. Well, that is, frankly, exactly what happened. Because while there were about 60 on Thursday night, by the Friday night service there were 200. By the Saturday night service there were almost 1,000. And nobody could figure out why. It wasn't because Dwight Moody was such a great preacher at that point in his life, but God was doing something special through his life and ministry. Well, um, that, uh, Moody eventually went back, to, um, went back to Chicago after a rather long evangelistic crusade. It lasted, they stretched it out, it lasted about a year over there in York, England, uh, with a, a reported attendance of over two million people who came to these bigger and bigger venues. But, but there was something significant that happened in those transactions. There was a face-to-face -face encounter between Edward Kimball and Dwight Moody. There was a person-to-person -person encounter between Moody and Frederick B. Meyer. And despite the fact that they had gone from a congregation this size to, to, to public meetings involving thousands of people, God was not so much using those big events for life transformation, he was using the person-to-person -person encounter, just as Jesus had that encounter with his disciples. Well, Moody went back to Chicago. He eventually invited Fred Meyer to come over and preach some evangelistic services in Chicago, which uh, got significant. In the late 1800s, those attracted significant uh, numbers of people. And one night in the congregation was, was a young man by the name of J. Wilbur Chapman. And Wilbur Chapman, again, he was, he was a teenager when he, when he uh, heard Frederick Meyer preach. It was a huge meeting, but afterwards he went up to Pastor Meyer and said, God ha has stirred something in my soul, and I guess I need to make a confession of faith and be baptized. And in that interaction between Frederick Meyer and Wilbur Chapman, God transformed a life, which would transform other lives. Wilbur Chapman was baptized. He became a very well-known Presbyterian clergyman. This is the first Presbyterian in this sequence of people here. He actually became eventually moderator of, of the Presbyterian General Assembly. And he eventually, in the late 
1800s, it was about 1890, 91, something like that, met a professional baseball player, a guy who played for the Chicago White Sox, a fellow by the name of Billy Sunday. William Hanley Sunday was, was a, a kind of a rare combination of not just a, a good athlete, but someone who had uh, a captivating personality. And as his uh, ball-playing career wound down, Billy Sunday then went out on the road as a traveling evangelist all over the country, and he had uh, a preaching career that lasted about three decades after his, uh, his ball-playing days were over. Again, it was not so much a, a big event that connected him to Wilbur Chapman, but a personal conversation, a personal interaction and engagement that made the difference and that God used to lead him to being someone who spoke literally to millions of people throughout his career and brought the, brought the gospel message to them. Well, Billy Sunday continued throughout the, uh, throughout the country for, for decades, there eventually was a group of people in Charlotte, North Carolina, who wanted him to come and to do a big crusade in Charlotte. They asked him. Uh, he was too busy. They asked him again a few years later. He was still too busy. Billy Sunday was booked literally years and years in advance at these evangelistic events. Finally, turning them down one final time, he said, I, I, I know a man who could, could do this for you. His name is Mordecai Ham. And Mordecai Ham was someone who'd been a traveling evangelist in the South in the early part of the 20th century. Uh, he had traveled most of his life. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was a grueling life, really. Business travel isn't uh, glamorous anyway, and, and uh, uh, it had taken a toll on Ham's health. But he agreed to, to do one more crusade in Charlotte before he retired. And he preached there for a couple years and finally got to the point where he said, I just don't have any energy left. And they begged him. They said, would you, would you stay one more month? And he agreed, okay, one, one, more, one more month. He had, uh, he had known Billy Sunday and, and, and shared... Uh, uh, faith and prayer and time together, and he thought, well, Billy would want me to hang in there with these people for at least a little while longer. So he extended his crusade one more month, and during that month, in the year 1934, uh, a tall, wanky 16-year-old uh, boy came forward to uh, dedicate his life to Christ, and that was William Franklin Graham, Billy Graham. Now, you notice that so far all of these people are men. That's about to change. Jessica, it's about to change. And the reason is because of a woman who made an impact on the world and on people's Christian faith that was incalculable. But it took a few years. It took about, uh, it took about 12 years. It was after the rest of the Depression and World War II Billy Graham was out here on the West Coast in 1946, and he went to the Forest Home Christian Conference Center, which had been founded by Henrietta Mears, who was the director of Christian education at First Presbyterian Church of Hollywood. She was the greatest Christian educator of modern times. She revolutionized teaching and not just teaching in the way the kids could understand it, but teaching in the way that adults could use tools which made sense to them for kids to understand the Christian faith. And one of the things that, one of her dreams was to have a, a conference center up in the mountains uh, where, where they could take kids from Hollywood Press uh, because they had so many, they had a Sunday school enrollment of 6,500 but it wasn't the big numbers that made the big difference. 
It was the small personal interaction, just like Jesus with his disciples, that changed lives. And so she was up there one, uh, one year in the summer of 1946, and apparently it was some kind of a big high school gathering. But after the big session, she would go back to her cabin, and she'd do some time of teaching and Bible study and prayer with some really committed young leaders. And one day there were three of those really committed young leaders who followed her back for a time of, uh, of Bible study there in her cabin. Billy Graham was one of them. Uh, it's hard to say exactly who the second one was because I've read various sources. Stuart McLennan may have been one or it may have been Dick Halverson. Both those gentlemen later became pastors of Hollywood Church. Uh, Dick Halverson going on, to be, uh, going on to be the chaplain of the United States Senate. But... One of the things that uh, uh, we do know is the third person was a young man by the name of Bill Bright. Bill Bright had been trying his, his hand at jewelry sales and apparently was not terribly good at it. Um, but, but he was coming to a significant life-changing commitment to Jesus Christ and it was really solidified in that small gathering, in Henry Edamir's cabin, just her and these three young men. And they asked her to commission them to the ministry. It wasn't really ordination exactly. That's done by churches and denom denominations. But they asked her to, to give them a charge to go out and serve Jesus Christ the rest of their lives. And the, the scene, as it's described by, by some historians, is that the three of these young guys knelt down, and, and she put her hands on each one in turn and prayed for, for them, for the transformation of lives that would, would take place uh, through them. And, uh, and that took place in a big way. In uh, 1952, Bill Bright began an uh, evangelistic effort on the UCLA campus that he called the Campus Crusade for Christ. It's gone worldwide. He and Henrietta Mears may be the two most influential lay people in the Christian life since the Apostle Paul. It happened through a very close personal interaction. There were a number of other people that they influenced. One of the first people that, that Bright wanted to talk to was, uh, was the, the outstanding young man on the campus, a gentleman who became, uh, at that time, the, the greatest athlete who ever lived, Rayford Johnson. And here he is on the right with Bill Bright on the left. And maybe from Bright's background in sales, he knew that if he could reach Rafer Johnson with the gospel of Jesus Christ, that Johnson's reputation was such that others would, would take that gospel seriously. And he did make a faith commitment. And then Rafer Johnson, uh, one of the people he contacted was a young guy from Santa Ana by the name of Don Muma. Don was fast becoming the, the greatest uh, football hero in the, school's, uh, in the school's history. Don eventually went on to become the pastor of Bel Air Presbyterian Church, where after a couple decades, they called a fellow by the name of Jack Springer, who was the, uh, the pastor right uh, here in our presbytery. Jack was a pastor at Palmdale and some other churches around here. And, and, um, and when he got there, he needed a... Uh, Started there, he needed a secretary. So he advertised in the Los Angeles Times, of all places, for a church secretary. They got 250 applications and nobody was qualified. He says his final qualifying question was to these various applicants, do you know what a presbytery is? Nobody did. <laughs> Until a young wife from the valley showed up and asked for an interview for the job, and her name was Ellen Baker, and she's my wife. And, and that's, well, that's how it got down to me. But it got down to me not because of any big event, any huge meeting of thousands of people which happened, even though there were some of those. There were some huge rallies. But any inspiration that happened in those big events was always confirmed 
by a personal one-on-one or small group interaction between a believer and someone who sensed a leading to inspire or help in the process of calling somebody else to a life for Jesus Christ. Here's what I want you to take away from this. That kind of interaction is what you do best. It was a phenomenon in the 20th century that uh, some churches grew very large. Thousands, sometimes tens of thousands of members, attenders, hangers-on. God uses that stuff, but that's very much of an exception to the rule. What God does mostly through the Christian life is use small personal interactions of people, and that's what you do best. That's what you do better than other organizations, other larger congregations, is the face-to-face personal engagement of one believer to another or someone who trusts Jesus Christ with someone who is considering that possibility. I would like to ask you to consider that God has brought you to this situation for such a time just as this, because as we move into the 21st century, people seem much more hungry for that personal encounter with others and what is significant in their lives. Doesn't mean there won't be large churches, big ministries, rallies, conferences, whatever. But God is working in a special way through the kind of encounters that you specialize in. The kind of encounters with not just one another, but with people out beyond our walls that you can do better than any megachurch in the country. They have to work hard to get over the barriers to those kind of encounters. You don't. It happens all the time. And so that's what I believe God is calling us to as local churches and as a denomination. I thank God for you and for the way God has worked in your life and I believe will work in the days ahead. You have a special role, a special gifting for a special task. And we give thanks to you in the Presbytery or 31 other sister congregations because we know God has put you here to do great things. And while ministries such as this may not get as much of attention as the the huge ones, most of those people in that sequence that you saw really didn't know what their contribution would lead to. But they made it. Didn't know what their interaction with somebody else would accomplish. But they gave that time. They gave that commitment. And we're trusting that you will be doing that in the years ahead. And so we give thanks to God for who you are and for God's call to you for such a time as this. The Lord's name be praised.